Resident Lighting Specialist to Arc Residential to Mac. Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Bert Herrero joins us from Pompano Beach, Florida, to discuss his career in custom integration, including his new, new role as a franchise owner with DAISY, the National Smart Space Installation Services Company. Our guest today founded First Priority Audio in Pompano Beach back in 2001 and led that CI firm until just a few months ago when it was acquired by DAISY. Then, just a few weeks ago, DAISY announced that Herrera would be launching the seventh DAISY franchise, this time in Ocala, Florida, which is one of the fastest growing metro areas in the nation. This is the second time in DAISY's first year that an independent owner who was acquired has then turned around and launched an entirely new DAISY franchise location. Entrepreneurial since the age of 18, Herrero has been building businesses for decades that incorporate his passion for technology, home services, and personalized client experiences. Building from his track record of running a best-in-class operation for more than 20 years at FPA, Herrero is looking to leverage Daisy's robust branch support systems to establish a strong presence in Ocala. But let me t- let him tell you more about that plan himself. Bert Herrera, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate you guys having us here. Sure thing. Um, I always like to just kind of get warmed up asking our guests um, how things are in their part of the country. It's a beautiful area there in Florida. We're past the hurricanes, hopefully. Um, how, how's the weather today on November 1st as we're recording? Well, it's a beautiful extended summer day. Uh, we don't see the differences in seasons much. So we have summer, extended summer, pre-summer, and then, you know, summer. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, it's a beautiful day out. It's uh, probably somewhere about 82, 83 degrees right now um, and uh, bright and sunny. Yeah, I can only imagine. A lot of hangovers, apparently, from uh, Halloween. Last that, night. That's what I was going to say. It's like an uh, interesting place to to be for Halloween. Um, it, it actually did cool off here a little bit, but it's been warm as well in central Indiana where I am. Uh, but it definitely looks like fall outside, so i um, feeling good about that. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of do two things. I want to talk about your career, obviously, because I, I love to learn how, how uh, folks in this CI industry get to where they are and w- what got them excited about doing uh, this as a career. Um, but like right out of the gate, I'd really like to talk about Daisy. We've, um, we've, we've spoke, you know, done, done some stories on, on Daisy, obviously on our um, website. And we've had, uh, you know, done some interviews on the, on the podcast as well. Um, I would love to know when you first started kind of know, learning about Daisy what drew you in in terms of the potential for selling your your company that you'd been running for more than twenty years um, to Daisy? What was that first kind of attraction to the to the um, company? Yeah, I appreciate it. So I think that's uh, really a two part kind of story. Um, I started back in about two thousand seventeen, two thousand eighteen. I started studying exit strategy. Um, I realized that that was something that seems like a lot of owners always want to do is exit, but don't really have the right plan to implement or put in place. Um, And that kind of helped me set goals and initiatives for what I wanted to accomplish and by a certain time frame. Uh, That time frame came along. uh, I decided to go ahead and list the the business for sale. Uh, And in that process, that's where I met Dion and Hagen. And we started talking more about uh, Daisy and, you know, the acquisition of First Priority Audio and so on and so forth. Uh, at the very beginning, this was July of 2023, by the way, when we started these conversations. Uh, at the very beginning, I still had no idea who Daisy was or what Daisy was really doing. Uh, as we went along more and more in conversation, it started to make more sense of what they were trying to do and accomplish. Um, I saw the their ability from a franchise perspective to really come into this industry with that experience uh, and saw their, you know, a little bit of their plan of bringing a lot of these owners along for the ride and helping with the industry experience and seeing that really jive and meld together. I, I thought this could be really powerful. So I paid a little more attention as we went along in the conversations. 
So I've interviewed Hagen as well, um, you know, and talked to her on the podcast and was very impressed with her um, as CEO and co-founder of, of Daisy. And um, she was mentioning one of the tr- challenges early on. I, I forget the terminology, but some sort of like clearinghouse for companies that are um, kind of available or something to that effect. Like it was hard for her initially to get a sense of our industry other than maybe a CE pro list top 100 or something. Um, how, how do you even find out who the companies are, you know? So I was intrigued when you said you listed your company for sale, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine that there are a lot of folks looking for an exit strategy now that they know Daisy is around and there's an opportunity there. It's a little easier, but what was that process like? Where are you listing it? It's not like you're selling your house. Like, what do you do to yeah, list your right. company for sale? That's a good question. Um, so I chose the route of a broker. Okay. I think trying to do this without a business broker to sell the business is incredibly difficult. So there is an MLS system for mm. uh, selling businesses. Uh, it is commercial real estate uh, as it stands. So okay. uh, I did partner with a broker. Uh, that broker really led me in a, in down a great path of really understanding, you know, more the sales side of the business. Because even though I was prepared from an exit strategy point of view, it was only to exit my business without having to be locked in as a long uh, earnout or a long uh, tenor of staying with the business to transition, I should mm-hmm. say. Uh, and he really explained to me a lot of how this the sale would operate from a back end perspective and especially with things like investors or whatnot. But at the end of the day, the truth is, is that I've built this business for 24 years mm-hmm. and, or 23 years and, you know, they kind of become your baby. Yeah. And so this would have been a really emotional process if I, if I tried to do it on my own mm-hmm. and I don't know that I would have had the success that I had uh, without the broker being the intermediary for, uh, for me. Mm. So the broker kind of helped to, um, line up the relationship with Daisy then, or actually with the, the founders before that they even had Daisy as a name, maybe, um, is that, is that how that connected? Um, yeah. So he listed the business in the MLS system or whatever brokerage system they use. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe it was Dion that found the listing uh, and Dion and asked or requested to have a conversation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they, the process is they typically sign an NDA. They receive, uh, you know, a, a small book of the financial so that they get an understanding or a picture of the company. Uh, and then the first conversation with Dion and myself, uh, along with Manny, the broker, we all sat there and, and talked a little bit more. It wasn't quite clear about what they were doing, but I think he was more interested in what my thoughts were and where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And I think that those were um, those were some leading questions to give him a better snapshot or a better picture of how the company was operating. Uh, did the company operate with or without me? Uh, and, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, and, and I've had um, an opportunity to attend a lot of different courses over the years where it's at a buying group meeting or CDA where they talk about exit strategies. And a lot of what comes up is, you know, extra day, uh, extracting yourself from that situation where the, the business can function without you there. It's really hard a lot of times in these CI uh, businesses, but, uh, another one is recurring revenue and how that makes your company more valuable. Um, is that a situation that you had where you had recur- recurring um, contracts and things like service contracts or um, a- anything that would help to add the value or increase the value of your sale? We did. We had a recurring revenue program that we had been doing for about five years or so. Mm-hmm. We started originally with one vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, we separated from one vision and decided to go ahead and, and carry the program on our own. Okay. Uh, we adjusted internally what we needed to do to be able to handle that for our clientele. And we successfully managed the program ourselves um, and continue to. Mm. Right? So um, we did have an RMR program. I don't know how much an RMR program really adds to the value of it because at the end of the day, you're really just looking at a P&L. 
And these, we're not really signing contracts. So we don't have long-term contracts on these RMR programs. They're just basically on a month to month basis, okay. right? Uh, it obviously helps when we have very good retention, right? And very little uh, cancellation rates. Uh, but, um, I think the, I think it all falls into the PL. I think it all breaks down into the EBITDA. And I think that that's how most of these investors are out there looking for. Uh, you know, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the EBITDA and then based on the structure of your company is how they figure out the type of multiple of worth of the company. Okay. And give us a better idea then in terms of um, how your, how first, uh, how priority audio, first priority audio was, um, um, how it compares to your average integration company. I mean, how do you define that? But I think we all, You've been in this industry as long as you have, you know that generally there's a lot of similarities between these companies and throughout the country. Would you say yours is unique in any way besides that uh, service program or pretty typical in the types of projects you do, the size and scale and all that? Um, Anything unique or pretty typical? Yeah, I would say typical in a lot of senses. Uh, I think there were a lot of focuses for me that I wanted to make sure that first priority had the differentiation between our competitors locally and and even in the marketplace. A few of those things were things like these service programs. I think we were pretty early on in offering the service programs within our market. Um, I think another thing was our our dedication to one type of system, right? So we didn't go out there and do a bunch of different type of control systems. Uh, and so we dedicated ourselves to one control system and we were really, really good at, at deploying those type of projects. Uh, the other thing is, is our, our efficiency. We wanted to make sure that we were being really efficient in how we you know, delivered projects. And I think a lot of that had to do with engineering properly, uh, leading properly, uh, making sure that we weren't, uh, you know, just kind of going through and making sure we weren't missing the ball on any of the processes necessary. So processes was a big thing for us. Uh, I think at first priority audio, we had what we call the FPA way manual. Mm-hmm. And that manual was being built out, uh, through the acquisition timeframe. Okay. Uh, and that manual really was, uh, you know, how to do things, how to process payroll, how to, how to order a product, how to deal with an RMA, how to, you know, greet the client, how to walk in and and do certain things, right? Put Mm -hmm. drop cloths down, uh, set your tools on the drop cloth. Um, Yeah, so that kind of stuff. And I think that those processes and those procedures are really important. They may or may not be things that are used on a daily basis, but at the end of the day, it makes the business more repeatable or duplicatable. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's easy to onboard others into our process and our culture when it's all documented properly. And I think that those are the type of things that were important to me to make sure we had in place and made the difference between First Priority Audio and some of the other companies in the market. And how many employees did you have at the time of your um, sale to Daisy? I want to say it was 13 or 14 employees. Okay. And were you at the situation where a lot of integrators are that you were looking to add employees or had, had you reached a kind of a sweet spot with the, the amount of business you had versus the number of technicians, for instance, um, or project managers? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so we actually went through a little bit of a, of a downscale, right? To, come down to that sweet spot of employees Hmm. Uh, in managing processes and managing uh, delivering projects systematically. I think what we did was we really increased our efficiency in our, our techs efficiency in our project management efficiency in our design work. Uh, And in doing that, we were able to find ourselves really downscaling a little bit to manage more of that overhead cost and and really ring up that net profitability, which I think was important for us. Uh, A lot of that started back in in 2022, Hmm. uh, and it was because of the implementation of EOS in the company. Oh, EOS? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've I've, I've intended in uh, EOS... um, training through HTSA um, a, a while back. So I'm familiar with it and I, I know how much it helps a company to have those 
regular planned meetings and accountability for different initiatives and that sort of thing. So that's what you're talking about. 100%. Um, I can tell you that I, I always found myself hiring people that were smarter than me because I knew that that was the only way I was going to be effective, mm -hmm. right? It was as a good leader. I think making the decision of bringing EOS into the company really changed me, period, because I was able to really set my vision in place and everybody understood their part to achieve that. Everybody had their rocks. Everybody had their accountability. Everybody had the scorecards. I mean, and it was it was just phenomenal to see how everything was really moving in the right direction cohesively. Uh, and uh, it really made a big difference in our company, in our culture, uh, in our in our deliveries, uh, and in our net operating profit, which is where it counts. And where did you first learn about EOS? Uh, I had known of EOS for a while. I think... Uh, I think the first reintroduction to EOS might have been One Vision. Okay. Uh, someone there at One Vision was doing EOS, and it kind of struck my chord. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a uh, one of my competitors, very friend, good friend, competitor, uh, Paul Biava of ETC in West Palm Beach, mm. uh, he had deployed EOS in his company, and I started asking questions about it, and he was like, "You need to do it. I'll do it for you." <laughs> and I'm like, "All right, I appreciate it, but I'll go find somebody." <laughs> so I did hire a company here locally that implemented EOS into the company, uh, and and it was great. Okay. Well, um, I I think before we get into more about Daisy and your um, franchise decision, I think that's really an interesting and fun part of the story. But I I want to just quickly touch on your earlier life and get a little touch a taste of that because I'm always interested to know how um you as a kid you know what you were like if you were into I I think we before we started recording I said that it seems like there's diff two different paths that I hear all the time one is I'm really into music I was like in a band and I couldn't do that anymore and I found this kind of career into audio and that type of thing and then there's the other one I took things apart and put them back together I like building stuff um so what, what was your childhood like that you got kind of into this sort of stuff? Yeah, I was a remote control car terrorist. Hmm. Uh, anytime I would get anything that was motorized or, you know, whatever, I'd tear it apart. Man. <laughs> I'd, I'd pull the motors out. I'd find the little gear wheels and I'd try to be creative and do other things with it. Um, my dad, I remember one time my dad gave me a brand new remote control car. And he came back in my room probably four hours later and it was deconstructed and it was starting to become something else. <laughs> you know, I think I was adding an extra motor to one of the Tonka toys, you know, and okay. just giving it a little more horsepower. Right. right. Um, so that, that was me. I always messed around with the electronics and, and dealt with the little circuitries and diodes and it was fun. Yeah. Right? Well, then your bias is you're entrepreneurial since the age of 18. So what what were you doing in your first business uh, ventures there as a kid? Yeah, so my first business was when I was 18 years old. My dad incorporated it for me. It was called the Antenna Doctors. Okay. And so uh, back then we had satellite, big C-band, KU-band systems. Yeah. Um, and what I'd go around doing was doing the local antennas because local channels weren't available on those CKU band systems. Mm. I, typically, you would get a regional station uh, channel from the southeast or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't get an actual local channel from your market. And so that was my job was going out there and installing local antennas for a lot of these clients. And then I found myself doing high gain local antennas. So I ended up doing markets like Vero Beach and uh, Naples and... Yeah, you know, the keys. Uh, so found myself in that little niche and I did that for a little while. Uh, then I, yeah. So that's how I got started in entre as an entrepreneur. And did you go to college as well? I did not. So uh good, good case of uh, getting, you know, figuring out what you're good at and just diving into it and being technical um, as a career path. So that that's great. When did you first, um, transition from antennas into what would kind of be concern, con considered custom in, in, in integration or installation. Sorry, my my mouth right. was not working there for a second. No, it's okay. So so that was uh, that was quite some time in between. I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, so 
it was 2001. So I've got to say it was, it was more likely about 10, 12 years, yep. somewhere in that range. Okay. I was doing uh, satellite system installations, uh, and then I moved into doing DirecTV installations. Mm. Uh, and doing DirecTV installations, DirecTV had just launched, and they needed somebody to run a phone room uh, here in, the, in Fort Lauderdale. And so I ended up being the telemarketing manager of this phone room doing this test market campaign for Hughes Network Systems back then. Okay. Uh, and, and so we ran this test market campaign for like 90 days and then they extended it for another 90 days because they couldn't believe the results that we were getting from the phone room. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the industry was changed. It was pretty cool. Uh, that was right around 93 or 94, uh, where we went from selling a one receiver satellite system with an 18 inch dish for $1,500. They turned to giving it away for a $199 installation fee. Mm -hmm. And we ran the test market campaign that basically changed that in the industry. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then I went from telemarketing there to running a call center at a travel operation. And I ended up being there for about five or six years. It was just, it was totally different. Yeah. Still in the telemarketing, telecom world, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was really fun. And then that had its up and downs, obviously, as you're there for five or six years, you're a young person, you you know, your life is just starting to deploy and you really don't know what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> um, that was just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, September 11th, 2001 happened. Uh, and September 12th, 2001, I walked in and I quit. Mm. I decided I was burnt out. I had enough and, you know, there was more to life yeah. than than this call center. This call center was operating from seven in the morning till midnight. Wow. I had 150 something employees and it was seven days a week. So it was nonstop. And I spent a lot of time there. I spent, you know, I was a director of the call center. Mm. Uh, I built it from, I was the first person on the phone. I wrote the terms and conditions for the program. Uh, so it was, it was a long tenor there in a short amount of time. Uh, it was fun. Mm. Then afterwards, I got out and my wife looked at me and she said, we just bought our house. What are you going to do? <laughs> I said, I'm going to go slap a hammer and a nail together and call it work. <laughs> and so I went back into satellite, started installing satellite. Back then, we still had DirecTV. We had Dish Network. We had Vroom. Vroom or Voom, I think it was. Voom or Zoom. What was it called? I can't remember. Right. I think it was Voom. Yeah, I think it was too. I, and that's a big one for me. Yeah. And so got back into satellite, doing satellite, then started helping a friend of mine out who was in this industry, mm. uh, doing some installations for him. And I'm sitting next to him one day, and we're in this theater the room, and he's putting all this stuff together, and he's programming the Sony Commander. It was about this big, right? <laughs> big old hand job, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's writing down all his macros on a sheet of paper, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he starts to explain to me, and I look at him, and I go, people are paying you to do this? <laughs> Three days later, I called him up. I'm like, I need to talk to you. He goes, go ahead. Come on. Let's do it. And so I started – what was then Burt's World, by the way. Okay. Um, very uh, very into myself, I guess, at that point in time. In <laughs> you life, know, there's right? so many out there. It's either you're, you're <laughs> some random AV that it sounds the same as another one, or it's the name of the owner. And so, you know, that, that, that happens. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So the name of the company was Burt's World. And then in 2003, uh, I happen to have been at church, and I'm listening to uh, Chris Lane. Uh, first priority of South Florida speaking about his ministry mm. and what his ministry does with children in the high school level and so on and so forth. And you know, I wasn't a great kid growing up and I wasn't a great kid in high school. Uh, but I looked over to my wife and I said, you know what? Name of the company is going to be first priority audio. We're going to support that ministry for the rest of our lives. Mm. And so we did and we do. Oh, wow. So we changed the name of the company and we continue to support that ministry. Uh, even till today, well, even though I'm not at first priority audio anymore, I still per support it personally. Yeah, that's great. So, um, you, you have, I'm sure a similar career arc after that, when you get into the industry and, uh, I, I would imagine that, um, it's, it, there's, there's a lot to get into there, but we, I really do want to get to talking about now becoming a Daisy franchise location. You sell you make this whole big priority of getting out, um, exit strategy, still a pretty young guy. You don't seem like the type that's looking to retire, but I, I get that, you know, you've, you've done this a long time and, and you get this opportunity and you become a brand ambassador 
briefly there for Daisy, um, which is kind of what I, I've seen some of the entrepreneurials have these executive roles with Daisy. Um, so for the short amount of time there, that transition before you decided to uh, start a franchise, what was that that role like for you? That was enlightening. I got to tell you, it's a, it's a different world. And so as a brand ambassador, I was charged with speaking to other owners that are interested in becoming you know, part of the Daisy system, right? Whether that's through acquisition or franchise. And of course, franchises are our main objective. Uh, so I became a part of the Fran Dev team, we call it, right? The franchise development team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as a brand ambassador, uh, it's been fun because I've learned a lot about franchising that I never understood. Mm. Um, it really opened my eyes to the kind of industry there is available as a franchise. Okay. Uh, in, 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 in any industry. Uh, really, but yeah. uh, it really gave me a lot of the understanding of what Daisy is doing and building on the back end. Okay, being a part of the team, being with the team, spending time with a lot of the people on the team, I think has really given me the confidence and under in knowing that this is strong and this is being built incredibly. It's being built right, uh, and I I think it's the. I feel like it's the franchise system that this industry has always deserved, mm. but never received. Interesting. Right? Yeah. It's putting the processes, it's putting the systems in place to help operate your company individually, right? As, as an owner of your company, help it run efficiently, help it run really, really tight. And for the purpose of helping the owners really realize their potential and the freedom that they should have as the owners of the company. That's, so that's, that's exciting. I, I, I love to hear yeah. that from you. Um, and, uh, the, the experience you had kind of evangelizing that, um, I was really interested to, to learn in September, um, that one of the other operations trying to make a go of the franchise model, you know, was savvy home and that Gavin Lancey had actually sold, um, to Daisy. So, um, that, that was it kind of almost like a proof of concept again, because he was so um, passionate about trying to make a go of his own franchise operation. And I knew it was going to be an uphill climb for him, but um, to basically say, you guys have it figured out. I'm going to go this route now um, was interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I didn't know much about it Mm -hmm. uh, until probably a week or so before. Uh, and, uh, then when it happened, I was really excited by it because I had read his story. He had just had a recent article, I think just before that, Mm -hmm. uh, in one of the, one of the magazines. Yeah. I think we were all kind of covering him because it was, he's a really cool guy and great to talk to really honest and real, um, and his story with his dad. And I didn't even know that his dad had been mentored by Gordon Van Zwyden, who was, um, one of the early. Um, franchise, uh, not franchise, but acquisitions, um, and now executives with Daisy, someone who I really respect as well and have worked with for years um, editorially. So um, that mm-hmm. connection was interesting uh, as well. Um, can you just tell me more about some of the things that you learned in terms of what the the power of the franchise model is, um, the way Daisy is doing it, the, how you you know probably knew some of just having it really the acquisition was a was a different sort of scenario where you're not really going in as a franchise then you're selling your company then you become part of the team um but so you need to maybe learn as much about the franchise as much as you did when you were in this new role so what were you kind of picking up on that you just said wow this is really a great fit for our industry well uh, i'll go back to before the finalizing of the acquisition i I came to realize that I, I wasn't ready oh, right, really? to okay. set sail into the sunset. Right, sort of <laughs> it was that early. You were um, like, oops. <laughs> oh, it, listen, I got, I got plenty of life in me. I've got plenty to go. Um, and I really started thinking about it and saying, hey, you know, if this is going in the direction I think it's going, it would behoove me to really have these conversations now before the, the finalization of the acquisition, right? So we started talking about the ability to open up my own location in, in that market area, hmm. uh, North Central Florida. Uh, and uh, so that conversation went well. Uh, it was received uh, with a lot of excitement uh, in me wanting to do that. It, the expectation wasn't that I was going to do it immediately. It was going to be a little while longer. Hmm. 
uh, as I'm sitting here seeing them building the back end and the operating system, right? The the way that they're gonna they're building the support systems for the franchisees. I need to be at the head of this and not on the backside of it. And <laughs> I thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to give it that go. Uh, take a lot of what I've learned over the 23 years at First Priority Audio and really condense that and be more impactful uh, sooner as I'm building the, the new brand uh, and be able to get in there and just kind of make it happen a whole lot faster. Uh, and, you know, I, and I say this a lot to a lot of the integrator partners that are asking questions about, you know, Daisy and want to know more about Daisy right now. I think that as I'm planning the opening of this business, right, I'm also planning my exit from this business Mm. because I think it's equally as important to have that plan and have that goal in mind already of where you want to go and how you want to, how do you, how you want to treat that exit strategy. And so, um, I think uh, I think I'm ready. I think I'm at it, and uh, I tell you, I've gotten nothing short of support from from the team. Uh, as you can see, the PR was something that was phenomenal. Uh, the opportunity for us to have this conversation right now has been awesome. Uh, I know that uh, one of our teammates has been unpounding the ground, so to say, uh, meeting with builders associations, architects, designers, and already starting to open doors and open conversations. Um, I'm getting the support on the, on the hiring and, you know, getting that ready and for recruitment. Uh, it just, it's, it's awesome how, you know, every person from the team really comes together to be able to have this conversation, uh, vendor support. Uh, I'm really starting to get an understanding of what the vendor programs are with Daisy and, and where we're at with certain vendors and relationships. And, you know, I think those would be a little easier for me to establish as well, but I, it's just cool that we're able to just work under the brand, you right? And have all that support behind you. I'm not at it alone. And, and this is, I think if I was doing this on my own, right, without Daisy, which I obviously I can't, yeah. but if, if I was doing it on my own without Daisy, it, it would be so much work to get to that point, right? And I just feel we're going to have such a strong impact in the, in the, in the marketplace from the get-go because of the support system and the team that's behind us already moving it in the right direction. Today's episode is brought to you by the Sonos Era 100 Pro. It's the Sonos solution you've been waiting for. Available in early 2025 exclusively through Sonos Partners, Era 100 Pro makes it more efficient and cost-effective to create custom audio setups for your clients. Crafted specifically to meet the needs of both commercial and residential installations, Era 100 Pro offers the same sleek design and acoustic architecture as Era 100 with a range of added hardware and software solutions to streamline your projects. With Era 100 Pro, you can configure more unique setups in new locations with PoE+. Era 100 Pro also provides secure installation, built-in theft deterrence, and multiple options for cable management with pro-grade mounts. And the new zones capability in the Sonos app gives Era 100 Pro users easier control of their system. Era 100 Pro is the first product exclusive through the Sonos network of trusted partners. Find out more information at Sonos.com. So you're moving from Pompano Beach, uh, which is on obviously on the Atlantic coast, up to central, north central Florida, um, to Ocala, um, not too far from the villages, which is famous for the senior living environment there. Uh, what was the, um, location decision for you there in terms of Ocala? Is it just such, is it so well known as a growing, uh, metropolitan area that you're like, that's the place to go, or do you have a family connection there? What's, what's the story there? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to say about four years ago, I purchased a home up in North Florida. Okay. Uh, and it's north of Gainesville. Mm-hmm. And knowing the area and understanding the area, seeing the area grow through COVID and even the after effects of COVID, I see opportunity in the area. And realizing that Ocala is that market where it's growing fast, it's rated just recently the one of the fourth fastest growing market in the United States or metro area, I should mm-hmm. say, in the United States. 
Um, so there's a lot going on in that area, but then also the villages, yeah. you know, we, w- the name of the company is Daisy Ocala and the villages. Okay. And it's because I want to make sure that we're servicing both communities or both areas, right? We want to make sure that we're providing a strong presence in the villages and giving, um, people aging in place, the, the right opportunity to, to embrace technology and use technology for their daily lives, but also have the support system available to them so that they're not alone. Mm-hmm. They're not doing it alone. Right. And I think that that's important, but also the, the strong thriving, you know, technology, young technology minded Metro area that's starting to grow there. It's starting to really boom. And I want to be in, in place there to make sure that we're providing our services to that market as well. I have sort of weird questions in terms of like looking back and looking forward, which is one is your, your, the company you sold now, when you, when you see it as a member of the, you know, Daisy team, what's it look like to you um, looking back at your former company and are they rebranding it already as Daisy? Is it still first priority audio? Um, Who is running it? Like, who's the general manager there on location versus, you know, you not being involved, but can you tell me about that? And then we'll look ahead to your, more of your plans for the new franchise. Yeah. So, um, the two running it are Joel Hernandez and Stephanie Ruiz. So Joel Hernandez is my cousin, okay. literally blood relative. Uh, and he's been with me since 2014 here at first priority audio. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Ruiz happens to be his wife. And she came and joined us uh, right at the beginning of COVID. Uh, So right in, I believe it was February of 2020. Um, They both took a lead role in operating the company Mm -hmm. from me. Uh, And that transition happened, which is one of the reasons why it was easy for me to step back. And um, I won't say not be missed, but not be missed. Yeah. Um, I think that that was, that was a strong point to the transition. Uh, regarding the transition, they are still operating as first priority audio. Okay. The tr- Daisy transition is happening. It's happening more on the back end and internally versus at the view of the client. Okay. Uh, but it will happen uh, eventually. Uh, you'll see first priority audio sunsetted and Daisy will be the brand name okay. that sticks around in the area. And, uh, yeah, I'm that's interesting because that. like I mean, Cyber Manor, uh, Gordon, Gordon Van Zwyden's company, you know, kind of did a different approach where it was a Daisy company underneath the, you know, Cyber Manor name that was well known in the area. So that that was an acquisition that was an interesting um, approach. And I know it's a work in progress on how all of the branding works. And that's the last piece of the puzzle, probably then the back end is the most important thing. Um, so that's really, really interesting to hear the connection to remaining connection with the family and all that. Now, as you look ahead, um, you, you, you answered the question, obviously a franchise, you, you go with the branding right out of the gate, um, and connect to the locations that you're representing or, um, selling to, into and uh, servicing. Um, you, uh, talked about some of the staffing assistance and all of that, which seems like a great service. Um, talk a little bit more about, um, you know, what, what you get to, what your investment is, um, to start with, I don't know how detail you need to get into numbers, but, uh, you, you make an investment obviously in, in the franchise fee, you, what, what's the arrangement again? I know I've talked uh, about it with Hagen, but, um, how, how does the stake in the game start with you? And then, you know, what are your ties back? And what's what's your freedom and independence there as well, you know, as a a franchisee? Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good question. So there is a, uh, there is a sign on fee to become a franchise. And I think that that sign on fee really, in my opinion, doesn't cover it, but uh, goes to covering a lot of the support that you get uh, as in my opinion, in my case, as a new franchise store, Mm -hmm. uh, all the support, like the PR, the the marketing, the assistance with getting bank accounts set up, getting you know the payroll accounts set up, getting all that kind of stuff, right? Vendor relationships, so on and so forth, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, there is a royalty 
uh, for the franchise, which is a percentage of revenue. Uh, and we worked out so that that percentage of revenue increases as my business continues to increase. Um, it was fair, I think, on both parts. Uh, and I think that their intent is to make sure that we're driving business as best and as quickly as possible. Okay. But for any franchisee looking to get into the system, it's the same. It's a, there's mm -hmm. a conversion fee. Uh, if you're converting a company, there's also a, what we call a greenfield fee. So if you're starting as a brand new store, mm -hmm. that would be a different fee up front. Uh, and then there's the royalty on a monthly basis of revenue. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And then you, you just get all that back end help and, um, you're taking such a load of pressure off your shoulders as an owner, um, of that location, not having to do all of the back office stuff out from scratch. Um, yep. and, and, and you mentioned that they're assisting kind of helping establish some of those builder relationships, um, as well. Yep. Uh, they have a part of their marketing team is, uh, helping, uh, getting in front of the architects association, the builders association, the design association, uh, getting in with some of these chapters in the local market and help do things like, you know, learning days or lunch and learns and that kind of stuff. And I think that those are the things that as business owners, we either don't have the time to, or we don't want to find the time to do, or we just don't have the expertise. It's not our desire. It's not what we're good at. Right? right. I think from a tech perspective, I am incredibly good at anything that had to do with tech. Mm -hmm. At some point, I had to shift myself to being a good business owner. Right. And I had to really start working on the things that were good for being the owner of the business. Um, I never found myself being great at going into those associations, right, and, and getting those lunch and learns going. Those That just wasn't my forte. Right. I was good at a lot of things. That wasn't one of them. And so to have somebody to support you on that, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. Right? I think once the door is open, I can have conversation with anybody and move through that door. <laughs> I think it's just getting the door open that, that sometimes could be a little bit of a challenge for a lot of us, you know, as owners, because yeah. we're good techs. We're just, we're not the greatest salespeople, right? right? We sell because we're incredibly good at what we do and we believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so do our clients. Yeah. So um, as we wrap up, I mean, just give me an idea of what your timeline is like now with the new company and um, how far along you are just in initial announcement about two weeks or maybe three weeks ago to um, establishing like an actual um, footprint locally, you know, with the business, uh, finding a rental location, building a new location entirely from scratch, uh, and then kind of what your personal timeline is for getting those clients started, you know, with projects and bringing in yeah. revenue. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, good question. So my timeline for having the physical location is mid month of November. So by oh, that's November quick. 15, yeah. I should have, I should have a location. I've been looking for a place already for the last two or three weeks. So I've kind of dialed down to a few locations. I'm just trying to make sure we get the right deal and, and are able to grow in that space for a little bit. Um, and then the same thing with employment, right? We're getting ready to put out the, the, the recruiting ads or the hiring job ads and start really recruiting for techs, uh, and some maybe middle management positions like uh, project manager or service managers or whatever. Um, I'm expecting to start hiring people right around mid December to the beginning of January. I think, uh, mid mid December would be more my, my right hand sort of say. Mm -hmm. um, people that are going to handle more on the ground. Uh, and then beginning the January 6th is our first day of operation. Mm -hmm. And so I expect to have employees ready to go. And hopefully, uh, if we can foster a few relationships, we should be able to bring up a couple of jobs with us uh, to get started with. Oh, right. Uh, so sure, I expect sure. to... Yeah, I expect to see this moving, you know, it, it may start slow the first couple of weeks, but I expect to see this moving pretty good and pretty smooth afterwards. We're also doing the home show at the World Equestrian Center. Uh, small story, back in uh, 2023, at the beginning of 2023, uh, First Priority Audio did the World Equestrian Center home show in the Ocala market just to kind of get a feel for it. Mm. Um you know, the visionary had a hair up his, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so we ended up going out there and, and spending some time and put up a really nice booth. 
Uh, I've been told that if there was a best of booth or best booth of show award, we would have won it. Uh, <laughs> and so it was really cool. Uh, we had a great booth. We had a, a great amount of inquiries. Uh, we never followed up with any business in the area because it seemed like the market really needed somebody to be there. Mm. Uh, and we weren't ready for that. Okay. And so, but I think it kind of led me to understanding more about the market and where I wanted to be. And so we're going to do that World Equestrian Center home show again uh, at the end of January. Okay. Uh, and I expect to really kick that off really strong after that. Nice. Uh, and and then just a really basic question. I would imagine part of your franchise agreement is to is help uh, building a, a website for your new company as well. So you're going to have that all set up. You know, that's a really good question. I, I came to mind today. It's like, uh, where's my website? <laughs> so I'll be asking that one. I don't have the answer to it yet. No, that's a fair point. I, I, you know, it's just, it's basic blocking and tackling for me as a podcast to say where, you know, where we send people to learn more about you. And at this point, we're kind of in that limbo phase. So we won't do that. Um, we'll, we'll tell people about daisyco.com um, as, as a good place to learn more about Daisy and leave it at that, I guess, sure. right? I think that I think that if I had to answer that question, I would say that we're driving all traffic through Daisy, and then yeah. you know the that person in that market is looking for, you know, someone in the Ocala market. We'll find a listing on there for our Ocala store. Yeah, that's a fair point, definitely. Uh, well, Bert, I really appreciate your your time. It's uh, great to hear your story, and it's uh, it's a really fascinating career path, and also just. Really intriguing to hear about Daisy's evolution. It's so early in the process, but uh, so many great little twists and turns already in just a year. So uh, great, great talking to you and best of luck with all the work ahead, which I know is going to be a lot, but it'll be made easier with the backing of, a, of an organization that's already kind of figured out some things with Daisy. Yeah, I am confident of that 100%. <laughs> Well, um, when, and when we when we talk about your your title now, we we say that you're CEO of um, the Daisy location. So, how, how would how would I end our podcast here with your title and company name as you want it to be said? For a long, long time, I've always asked people to call me coach, right? I'm, I'm a head coach. That's who I am. <laughs> I love to lead. I love to put teams together. I love to get people moving in the right direction. So I, I'm not big on titles. I'm not big on, uh, on, the, on, you know, the notoriety. Right. So, um, but Hey, listen, I I'm here to build a team and that's what I want to do. And, and so call me coach, call me friend, call me boss, call me whatever you want. You know? Well, we'll, we'll say that, that Bert Herrero is head coach of Daisy Ocala and the villages and you can learn more you about <laughs> daisy right now at daisyco.com and uh that wraps up today's show which was produced by residential tech today ipw pretty easy po and pretty easy podcast if you're new to residential tech talks please subscribe to the podcast wherever you watched or listened to this episode also check out all the latest residential tech news at our magazine's website restechtoday.com where you can also subscribe to the print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Thursday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell.